And I felt so tapped out. I felt like I had no time to rest. You know, you work nine to five, Monday through Friday. You only have 48 hours. How do you divide that between your kids, your parents, you know, the need to lie on the couch and binge watch television or read a book and just relax, whatever it might be. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with Jolene Hill of YourLifeTalks.com. She designed these beautiful conversation starter cards because she wants to help people have more meaningful conversations. And I actually just wrote an article for 60andMe.com about using her cards at Thanksgiving and upcoming holidays to have more meaningful conversations at the dinner table with your loved ones. Next week, we're going to speak with Ann Campanella, who's the author of Motherhood Lost and Found. It's her memoir that talks about how Alzheimer's and infertility intersected for her. It's an award-winning book, and Ann is also a passionate horsewoman and a member of All's Authors. You're really going to enjoy this conversation. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me, my coffee in my hand, so let's begin. Today we're speaking with Liz O'Donnell, who is the founder of Working Daughter, a community for women balancing elder care, career, and more. An award-winning writer, she recently published her second book, Working Daughter, A Guide to Caring for Your Aging Parents While Earning a Living. A former family caregiver, she's a recognized expert on working while caregiving and has written on the topic for many other outlets, including The Atlantic, Forbes, Times, WBUR, and PBS's Next Avenue. And she's delivered keynotes on the topic to many audiences, including at Harvard University and the Women Leading Government Conference. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you. I want to start off by asking you if you could just tell us the backstory here, uh, a little bit about the experiences that led you to becoming an expert in caregiving while also working. Yeah, it was absolutely um, expert by necessity. Mm -hmm. I was uh, working as the primary breadwinner in my family. I had two young kids. I had two parents. must have been about 80 in the early 80s. And they started to need more and more as as can be expected. So my husband was doing their finances and I was coming, they lived about an hour away. I was going down on the weekends to cut their lawn, do some grocery shopping, you know, sort the pills, whatever they needed around the house. And I felt so tapped out. I felt like I had no time to rest. You know, you work nine to five, Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. You only have 48 hours. How do you divide that between your kids, your parents, you know, the need to lie on the couch and binge Mm -hmm. watch television or read Mm -hmm. a book and just relax, whatever it might Mm be, you know, social, et cetera. And um, so I was already feeling tapped out. I had no idea that it could be so much more intense. And what happened was both of my parents were diagnosed with terminal illnesses on the same day. Uh, so I got a phone call, 
something's up with mom and dad. Can you go? You know, that was a, a whole long week of details, but and culminating in this day where I went from one hospital where they said, your father has Alzheimer's and he can't go home. He needs to be in memory care to another hospital where they said your mother has ovarian cancer and three months to live. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so I thought I had been stressed out and busy, and I thought I was somewhat of a working daughter caregiver, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it just amped up full time, and I had to figure out how to make it all work and figure out what they needed. Mm -hmm. Are you that kind of person who is good at figuring things out? I mean, did you already have kind of a disposition to do this or how did that work? <laughs> That's a great, I laugh because I am um, good in a crisis. I'm great with logistics. I'm good at what I call contained pain. So if there's, you know, my parents had been sick off and on over the years, um, you know, maybe oh, looks like my mom needs heart surgery or, you know, dad fell and he's at the hospital. And those kinds of moments I can really turn on. I chuckle at the word disposition because the thing I did not feel qualified for was to be a compassionate caregiver. I tend to be more, you know, task focused. Let's get things done. Like I said, logistical, mm. not the warm fuzzy. How are you feeling? Let's talk about end of life. You know, what do you need? Kind of Existential person. issues. <laughs> not so nice. What do yeah. you want for lunch? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I really, um, struggled in the beginning because I already felt, you know, like so, um, strapped to find time to be with my kids and you know as a working mother and now I'm being pulled into this third direction and I spent a lot of time like why me I can't do this why is this falling on my shoulders I'm not even you know best suited for this mm -hmm. I see so I'm just imagining um, as a therapist there might have been a lot of mixed feelings there oh yeah I mean and and that's one of the things I see with what I now, you know, have termed working daughters is the guilt is just, you know, through the roof, off the charts, if you will. You, you hear so much about working mothers having guilt, and I know that it exists. I, however, never took that on. I felt like it would be silly to feel guilty about providing for my family and guilty about putting my family over my job, you know, whenever those times came up, you know, have to call in sick to take the kids to the doctor or go see the school play. I just thought, I am doing two really important things here, no guilt. But when you add that third layer, mm -hmm. then you're trying to decide now between, you know, three needs, maybe more needs, you know, you, you might have a spouse who actually wants to talk to you sometimes, or you want to take care of yourself, or, you know, you have a passionate volunteer job, who knows, you know, we have so many things going on. To figure out how to slice things up that way, you're just never sure you're making the right decision. Um, and the other thing I think specifically around elder care, where the emotions can be so fraught, is there's always more to do. I mean, we're just not really set up as a society to make the time to take care of our parents. So we're so busy attending to their basic needs, get them to the doctor, make sure the fridge is full, make sure the errands are done. We barely have time to say, hey mom, I know you can't get out of the house anymore. Would you like to take Saturday afternoon and go visit your sister who's also housebound? Or you know, would you like to join a group and I can look for it and you know drive you there? You don't have any time for those really important aspects of an adult's life. And so you just fraught thinking there's always more to do, but I really need a nap. <laughs> that's, a gr that's a great tagline. <laughs> and so what were the, I, I mean, it sounds like there was a part of you that was very aware you were, as you say, tapped out. Were there other things that kind of snuck up that, that you recognized as I'll call burnout what are the other things that were happening that you recognized were just signs that you you were stretched too thin? Well, I was really, really grouchy, mm -hmm. <laughs> to use a polite word. Um, yeah. and, and that was an important lesson early on was I 
was doing what I thought a good daughter should do and what I thought, you know, people would expect that I should do. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, before the diagnoses, even I, when I would go drive the hour on Saturday and take my mother to the grocery store and she's on a walker and it's like, you know, a three hour ordeal. And then I'd get home. And so I'd be snappy when I was visiting my parents, I'd get home and I'd be snappy to my husband because Mm -hmm. I was stressed out. And, you know, then that snappiness would pass on to the kids and I, finally I don't I, I can't tell you what it was I'm just grateful that it happened but this light bulb went off and said you are doing nobody any favors you know by by doing what you think you should be doing nobody wants to be around you including yourself so <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes you so what is it that you want to be doing and so I kind of went through this thought process okay I want my parents to be cared for I want them to be fed I want to visit them every couple of weekends or maybe once a weekend but I don't want to spend every Saturday you know rushing to the grocery store then feeling guilty there's that guilt again that I didn't stay and have dinner because I want to get home to my kids and so I started to order groceries online I mean it was a simple little shift it was a bigger deal because my mother preferred to go to the grocery store. It was one of her outings, you know, and, and certain brands aren't available on the online delivery as they are, you know, in the store. But, I, you know, I she had other choices. I had to remember she did have other choices to get to the grocery store. She could ask a neighbor. She could, I don't know, you know, take a ride, share the van or whatever. Um, and so you had, you know, she was making her choices but I was free to make my choice as well. And my choice was make sure she's fed and visit her. Occasionally we'll do the in-store shopping, but by saying, okay, this is what I need and I'm also fulfilling your basic needs, I was a much nicer person. Mm. So you're talking about delegating and not saying I have to do everything and meet everybody's needs. And also it sounds like prioritizing what's gonna give you the most value. And, and your mom, what's going to give her the most value? Um, yeah, it's a lot of prioritizing because you are pulled in so many directions and you can't do everything really well. You know, I like to say, what, where are you going to thrive and where are you just going to glide? You know, because you can't thrive in all areas all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was also giving up this image of what the perfect daughter, the good girl that, you know, we're, we're, I think women are raised to be, and it's hard for us to sort of shake that, oh, I'm supposed to be a good daughter and then a good student and then a good wife and a good mother and then a good daughter all over again. And we, I think we hold ourselves up to a standard that isn't attainable and quite frankly, isn't necessary. Mm-hmm. I see. Do you remember, um, the moment when you said, I need to start writing about this experience? I don't remember that moment. The moment I remember where the term working daughter came to me was I had written um, a book about working mothers and the experience working mothers were having at about the same time my parents started to need more and more. And so I had this one day where I started before 6 a.m., Uh, you know, sending work emails. I had taken a vacation day because my mother had a doctor's appointment she wanted me to take her to. So get up, you know, prior to six, send some work emails, get some work out of the way, see the kids off to school, get in the car, drive to my mother's house. Uh, She was running late. We missed the doctor's appointment, reschedule the doctor's appointment, you know, go pick up the the change in uh, prescriptions after that, take her to lunch because, you know, wanted to spend time with her, not just do the air and get back in the car, drive home, blah, blah, blah. Uh, That night I had a speaking engagement and I was speaking to some young mothers about balance. I mean, oh, the irony, right? Here I was like (laughs) having the most stressed out day ever. And so as I was driving home now on a day that started before six, and now it's around 11 p.m., I thought, enough about working mothers, what about working daughters? Ah. And that was like my little light bulb moment where I suddenly thought there is a whole host of information out there to help working mothers navigate. And yes, my book was one, but it was one of many, many. But now here's this new reality that I'm feeling that there must be many others and turn, you know, turns out there are millions of us. And Mm -hmm. why aren't we talking about this? And so that was the moment I think I became obsessed obsessed with this experience (laughs) and you were um 
it, it became clear early on that you were not the only person in this position. Is that that's my guess? It actually wasn't. It became clear at that moment. It wasn't clear early on, and I think that's one of the issues that working daughters face. You know, if you're a working mother, you you know you sport a very large stomach. Assume you know unless you're adopting. But even if you're adopting, you all of a sudden have this baby that you're bringing with you places or child that you're bringing with you places and people shower you with gifts and they give you advice. And, you know, there's a whole sort of culture around helping new mothers um, and fathers figure out the experience. If you're all of a sudden taking on elder care because either, you know, it's just sort of crept up on you or there's a crisis, there's no moment in time. There's no celebration. Mm-hmm. There are no gifts mm-hmm. or useful tools. There's no, you know, mm-hmm. shower. Um, and so you don't necessarily know that other people are going through it. It's also a really tough topic. And, you know, I, sometimes I joke, I'm like, here comes Liz. She's going to talk about death, disease, and dying. You know, I don't get a lot of invites. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was joking with my editor because I've been doing a lot of work around facing our mortality, preparing for mortality, and I thought maybe I should rename the podcast uh, Deathful Aging or (laughs) Zestful Dying. I like it. I like it. Hey, Zestful Agers. Last year, I attended the International Federation on Aging's Global Conference in Toronto, and they've announced the 15th Global Conference on Aging for Niagara Falls, Ontario, from November 1st through 3rd, 2020. Zestful Aging Podcast is a proud partner for this conference, and I encourage you to all consider attending. The conference features prominent experts presenting and discussing critical issues within the field of aging. So head on over to ifa2020.org to learn more. And I hope to see you in Niagara Falls in November. So yeah, so tell me a little bit about it's actually not only a book, but you have a bona fide community for women. Could you tell us about that? Sure. So early on, as I became obsessed with this topic, I have a friend who's an entrepreneur in in the media world. And she said, you've got to start a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I don't have time for Facebook right now. Um, But I listened to her and I'm glad I did. Um, And in the beginning, you know, there were just a couple of hundred women at first, you know, I forced a few friends to come in. (laughs) (laughs) All your friends and relatives. Yeah, make the group look big. And um, but people, I don't remember, actually, I couldn't even tell you how people started to find it, maybe a couple of podcast interviews I did or something at the time. But now it's about, probably about 2,500 women and a few men, we, they call themselves the working dudes. Um, ah. Yeah, it's great to have their perspective. And it's a place where people come every day, the engagement, the activity level is really high. It's a place where people come to not be alone to say the things that um, are difficult to say in polite company. I talk about this concept that uh, caregivers understand that we can hold two opposing truths at the same time. Like we can Mm -hmm. say, I know on one level that being able to care for my parents in their most vulnerable moments is a gift. At the same time, I can, I can also, you know, hold this truth. I can't take it anymore. This Mm -hmm. is really hard, you know. It just brings you to your knees. Yeah. Yeah. So the community has been, um, you know, I I get wonderful feedback that it's been a real lifesaver for some women to find a place where they can go and talk. And quite frankly, it's been a real um, uplifter for me as well to um, be a part of this community and and see uh, the way the other women support each other. It's really wonderful. Mm hmm. And so you've been writing articles and you've been talking about some of the real lapses, I think, in our in our culture about that. This is not recognized enough. And that, if I'm not mistaken, you talked also about that um, we're saving as as caretakers um, insurance companies, perhaps a lot of money that something's not right here, that this is really falling on the backs of the kids and it has great costs. Great costs. And it's only going to get more intense. So we're at a point, at least in the United States, 
where 10,000 people are turning 65 every day, you know, because we've got that baby boomer generation that's aging. And we are facing some other issues um, in our society that make caregiving become family caregiving more intense. So we have more dispersed families. You know, not everybody lives in the same community, on the same block, in the same town, even in the same state anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have, you know, children in California and children in London and someone in Massachusetts. Who knows? We're having fewer children. So the work of care, family care, is falling to fewer people. Um, and immigration laws, quite frankly, are affecting, right. um, you know, the professional caregivers. So we're facing a shortage of professional caregivers in the coming years. Immigration laws and also the fact that, and I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but um, paid professional caregivers don't always receive the same workplace benefits as, you know, maybe a white collar worker or um, a, a medical professional. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the most attractive career to go into. So... So we're seeing even more intensity around the issue. And I, of course, now I forgot where I started on this, what your exact question was. But. Yeah, no, that you're really talking about not just the difficulty of being a caretaker, but some of the uh, socioeconomic uh, issues, um, some fairness issues, some political issues about why this is so complex and so important for us to start paying attention to. Right. And so therefore, as more and more responsibility falls onto these family members, and I focus on women because that's just always been the audience that I wrote for. But actually, the, at least again in the United States, the split, the gender split of family caregivers is 60% women, 40% men. Mm -hmm. So it's not all women doing it. It's, the majority is still women, but um, there are a lot of men that are also doing this. And it is very difficult to uh, balance career and care. And so what you see, especially among the women, is they may cut back their hours or shift to a lesser responsibility role at work or quit altogether. And then that's impacting their earning and mm -hmm. savings, potential, you know, retirement and all of those benefits to the tune of $300,000. And mm -hmm. yet who's going to pay for their long life and retirement? We're living longer. You know, medicine is keeping us alive with chronic illnesses for a much longer time. Uh, our medical needs, our retirement needs, our housing needs are all going to be very expensive. So yeah, we're, um, we're doing a lot of work for a lot of other people, whether it be our legislators, our insurance companies, mm -hmm. our medical professionals. I see. Do you, are you involved in trying to make policy for this, this issue? Is that part of your role? Not in any, um, I can't take any credit for any meaningful way yet, but it's absolutely something that I plan to do. I um, just recently went through another caregiving um, year or a couple of years. So I'm just um, coming out of that experience. But absolutely, especially in an election year here in the United States, it's frustrating for so many that it hasn't been a predominant election issue, and it really should be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your goal with this and your knowledge and your experience is, is to have some kind of influence on policy where this starts to change. Yeah, I mean, my, my goal oversimplified is to make sure no one goes through this alone. Um, and whether that's because we have better institutional support, whether it's from, you know, our employers, our, as I said, our legislators, the medical industry, or from the community, in all of those ways, I hope to make a difference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so important. And I think there are people, I think you mentioned earlier, that are just feeling so alone with this. Yeah, it can be a really isolating experience. Again, one, you know, it's it doesn't naturally come up. Hey, you know, when I go home, I'm, um, I don't know, giving a shot to my father in the back of his arm or, you know, I'm, th those topics don't naturally come up as opposed to, you know, I'm having a play date this weekend. Um, so you just don't know that other people are going through it. Mm-hmm. Do you have any advice for our listeners who are... Um, becoming caretakers or anticipate becoming caretakers? Do you have any advice for them as they they may be struggling with this new role that probably feels overwhelming, at least at times? 
Yeah, I would say um, as much planning as we can do as possible, the better off we are. And of course, it's a topic we want, you know, we want to avoid. So um, we don't plan as much as we should. But if you're in a situation where you can start to have conversations with your parents about what their desires are, mm-hmm. then you're just going to be in a much better place than those of us who, you know, couldn't or didn't or whatever that might be. And it's, a you know, I know there's a lot of resistance around that because people feel like they're saying, hey, mom and dad, let's talk about when you die. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's actually, you know, if, if we reframe it, it's, hey, mom and dad, what are your goals for the next phase of your life? You know, whatever that phase might be, however that long that phase might last. And, and in listening to our parents say, my goal is to spend more time with my grandchildren, to be as healthy as possible, to, you know, make sure I never leave my home, whatever it might be. Then we can start to say, okay, so how do we plan for that? You want to live at home and yet, you know, you can no longer navigate the stairs or you can't afford the repairs anymore. So what do you think we, and it's, it's much more of a problem solving, almost negotiation mm. style conversation. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to do because it's charged with emotion. But if we can get to those places pre-crisis, mm-hmm. it's such mm-hmm. a gift. You know, my mother, um, one Thanksgiving, I remember said, I want to talk about uh, my funeral planning. And this was well before I even felt like a caregiver, you know, and I was like, really, mom, over Thanksgiving dessert, you know, what a downer. And later on, I realized what a dope I was. That is a gift. (laughs) That was a great opening. It's so funny you gave that example because one of my guests said, that's the perfect time to do it at Thanksgiving. Everyone's around the Uh table and you, and that's the time to say, listen, this may seem weird, but we have to, no, we have to be aware of what uh, people's end of life wishes are. We yeah, need that information. Yeah. I understand that now. And I understand what a dope I was for, you know, <laughs> wanting to shut the conversation down. But, you know, uh-huh. hindsight is twenty twenty. It is such a gift. And I remember once my parents ended up in the same facility, but my mom was upstairs in the assisted living and my dad was downstairs in the memory care unit. I had been upstairs visiting my mother. I came downstairs. I ran into my aunt, my father's sister. And she she was going to visit my dad. And she said, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I was just upstairs with my mother. We're going through um, all of her funeral arrangements. And she said, oh, you know, and she looked, my cousin was there. And she looked and said, don't you ever bring that up to me. And wow. I've, I've since brought that conversation up to them. They said, oh, no, we've talked, you know. So. Oh, my goodness. It is still taboo, although... Mm. Um, I just saw an interesting article in the Times by John Leyland talking about, you know, this whole thing of a good death is starting to gather some steam. It what is. do we want it to look like? Death positivity is is starting to enter the conversation. So important. So important. Mm-hmm. Are there particular tools that you've used that you might recommend to our audience about starting the conversation? Anything you like or, or you've used? No, for me, it's not so much a tool as it's this approach about focusing on goals. So okay. asking your parents about their goals versus mm-hmm. saying, you know, when are we moving you to the nursing home? Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah, that's Or right. do you really think you can live here, you know? <laughs> Oh, dear. That, um, yeah, that sounds problematic. And then, you know, on workingdaughter.com, I have a worksheet around finding balance and prioritizing. And I think that's, you know, so we, the, the planning and the tools, that's one of the practical aspects of it uh, or the mm-hmm. tactical aspects of it. I think the other advice I would have for listeners who are or who will be caregivers is to think about, okay, what are the most important aspects of my life and where am I going to coast for the next few years as I go through caregiving and where am I going to continue to, you know, really give it my all. And similar to what we were just talking about, talking about end of life, I think it's really important for a caregiver to plan for post caregiving. And that alone also, that topic can make people fraught with guilt. Wait, you're you're asking me to anticipate and look forward to when my parents die? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I actually am. Um, You know, not in a gleeful, sick, twisted kind of way, but in a, if we think about, and, and for me, this came up because I felt like when both of my parents were diagnosed and all of a sudden I, you know, was thrown into all of this, you know, all of these tasks. And I remember I met with a hospice nurse. And she actually, it was a really pivotal conversation with me because 
she was saying, okay, so you're going to come over here every day and you're going to administer the pain medications. And, and I said, wait a minute, I have a job. And she said, but your mother has a couple of months. And I said, but I have a job and I have kids and I have a husband. And, and, and she really, you know, saw how distraught I was and realized, I think, that she'd made the assumption that I was free to be there every day. And we had this really great talk. And through that talk, I was able to say, okay, I want to make sure my marriage is intact when this is over. And I want to make sure I'm still a good mother, you know, when this is over. And I need to still be employed when this is over. And I think oftentimes we think as caregivers, because there, there are very real stresses and, you know, health burdens that can come with being a caregiver. But we think, oh my God, when this is over, I don't want to be needing care. I want to have some good years. So, you know, what are my goals for post-caregiving, relationship-wise, career-wise, health-wise? And then you can start to build into your life a little time to, you know, take walks or do meditation or make sure you show up at work, maybe not in the same role, but, you know, you stay networked, whatever it might be. So I think that's another really powerful tool, plan for post-caregiving because it informs how you go through caregiving. That's a really interesting aspect that I have not talked much about on the podcast or actually thought about. You're talking about being very intentional and planful, even though this is probably the highest, one of the highest stress times of your life, but saying it's not only the current crisis, it's what's going to happen when the crisis is over. And some people find that after their caretaking role, they have to figure out who they are again because it's it's gone on so long um, that I, I just saw a short documentary called it was something like the eight year emergency <laughs> you know and yeah. this idea that you're just always on always on and then when it's over now what do I do with my time and my en- energy yeah I hear a lot from the working daughters in the community I, uh, my life as I knew it is over or my life is on hold. And I definitely had those moments in the beginning, you know, when both of my parents were diagnosed where I, I, I can empathize, I understand. But for me, it's one of the most heartbreaking things I hear because life doesn't, there's no pause button. And the sooner we can get to, okay, I never planned this in a million years. I wouldn't have, you know, vision boarded that this is what I wanted my life to look like, but it is your life. So what are you going to do? You know, so, so what now, what not say, not, and I, Uh I say, I don't expect you to be a Pollyanna about it. Like, Oh, this is, you know, I'm going to find joy no matter what, but to be able to say, okay, so how am I going to make this work? How am I going to eke out? Maybe it's only five minutes at first. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Maybe it's one day a week, but somewhere where I'm still me and I'm still pursuing what matters to me. Because the other thing that I think we're starting to understand, and I don't know if you saw the um, report that came out of Harvard Business School recently about creating a culture of care for companies, is that we're starting to understand that caregiving for so many of us isn't a one time and, you know, one and done experience. Mm -hmm. We're on this whole continuum of care where we might be, you know, parents and then elder care and then spousal care Mm -hmm. and you know so Mm -hmm. to say my life is on hold until this is over Mm -hmm. you never know what's coming next so how can you learn to live through the experiences as opposed to wait for them to end yeah i think that is such an important point and one that's not talked about enough frankly um so tell our, our listeners where they can reach you and and check out the community Excellent. So workingdaughter.com mm-hmm. is the hub. So there are probably okay. about 300 articles on there um, from, you know, first person <laughs> confessions to, um, you know, really practical how to's and workbooks and worksheets and that sort of thing. And from there, there's a Facebook community called Working Daughter. Okay. Um, it's a closed group. You know, yes. And uh, so people can speak their truth. And then the book that uh, just came out is on Amazon. Okay, that's great. And it's Liz O'Donnell. Thank you so much for talking about your experience, your expertise and bringing this additional piece about, you know, how do I maintain some semblance of life while I'm doing this very important thing that's often fraught. Uh, Talk about mixed feelings. Well, thank you for the interest. I appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at nicolechristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Next week, we're going to speak with Ann Campanella, who's the author of Motherhood Lost and Found. It's her memoir that talks about how Alzheimer's and infertility intersected for her. It's an award-winning book, and Ann is also a passionate horsewoman and a member of All's Authors. You're really going to enjoy this conversation. See you then. 